Do you remember the edge form that I was setting here in the first shop expansion video? Well, as it turns out, it was not strong enough. It bulged out. If I had had one more guy so I could have been watching the forms while they took the load, I would have caught this blowout and fixed it. So this is a good example of the how good, how fast, how much paradigm. A little slower on the setup and this wouldn't have happened, but I didn't have the time. A little more help on the pour and this would have been caught, but I didn't have the money. So I got the speed, I got the cheap, but now I have to fix the mistake. The space that I have added to the shop will eventually have a bathroom, a heated and cooled office, and quite a bit of extra space for woodworking. But in the near term, it's just for storage. Now if you missed those previous videos that I mentioned, take a look. This addition is really only sort of a partial addition, because I put the roof on 20 years ago. And now I'm just putting a floor in, and walls, and a door, and you know, some of those things, but it feels good to finish what I started, and it's going to feel really great to be able to reclaim the space and put it to work. Now, perhaps the very best part of working on your own shop is that it's really likely that all of your tools and all of your materials are right there at arm's length. You pros know what it's like to be working on somebody else's property and then realize that something was left or forgotten or not picked up or taken out of the truck or locked in the cabinet, you don't have the key, and so you've got to improvise or shut down to go get that tool or that board, but not here. It's all right here, and it's kind of nice. This is not a big job by any means, but there are plenty of cases where work like this will have a two-man carpentry crew. I've been working by myself for much of my career, especially the last half of my career, and most of the time I like working this way. There's almost always a way to get it done, by yourself, in just about the same period of time it would take for two guys. In fact, there's an Army Corps of Engineers statistic that asserts that every time you double your crew size, you lose 20% in efficiency. In my experience, this is absolutely true. Perhaps it's a conservative estimate. And I'll have a lot more to say about this when we are building this back house. For those of us who earn our daily bread working with our hands and feed our families by making things for other people and uh, you know being creative for a living, you just have to have a place to work. But for those who are simply compelled to build, who are driven to create, who have making and the urge to make things deep in their bones but earn their living some other way, a shop seems almost a necessity anyhow. It's certainly something that I think probably would haunt your daydreams and always be hanging out there as something that if only I could justify. But maybe there's more than just one way to think of a shop. I know that the world has always been really, how can I say this, that probably many of the needs that people have had over the centuries and millennia for things have been met by people who were making things in what we would scarcely even consider now to be a shop. And there are, there are men and women now who are working in primitive conditions and turn out things of great beauty and great creativity and great utility. And so there's no doubt about it that I at least am spoiled to have a shop like this. And so maybe if you're part of that group that doesn't have a shop yet or who sort of is obsessed by the forced, delayed gratification that so often is part of working up to a workshop, you could just realize, we could just realize that a toolbox is perhaps an entry-level shop. And then I remember migrating from a toolbox or a handful of tools to a truck with a crossbed toolbox and thinking, wow, this is a real productivity boost. 
and I feel like my stuff is secure and it's dry and now I can get something done. And then there may come a time when the best you can do to create dry space is just, you know, throw up a tarp. Stretch a tarp from some trees or from the edge of a building and create some dry space for whatever it is that you're needing to do. I mean, the term shade tree mechanic is in fact a pretty accurate description of most of the way that I have done car mechanic work for a lot of my life. Never did get any good at it either. And then maybe the next logical step in the progression towards a full-fledged shop would be a lean-to. If you have a structure that and space to put a lean-to off the side of a building, a le- you know, a lean-to is a lot less money than a freestanding structure. doesn't take much to throw a ledger up and maybe some hangers or just pressure blocks if you don't have access to hangers and throw some rafters over to a beam that's held up on a couple posts. And presto, that's beginning to feel like a shop. Or a garage. How many garages in this world have seen the last automobile and instead have got all sorts of tools and sawdust and wrenches and oil on the floor and who knows what? Forges, for crying out loud, and anvils and any of the other accoutrements of craftsmanship. Pretty nice. I can remember when I finally had a garage to spread out in. Felt like now the quality of my work could go up. But that, I think, had was an excuse for perhaps a lack of attention to detail when my conditions were a little more primitive. I don't know. Shops can be rented. There's a local smith, a very accomplished smith, Andy Donor, who rents his space. Big, beautiful, spacious shop. Maybe you can make an arrangement to share shop space with someone. Maybe share the rent. Maybe provide some labor for someone who would then let you use their facility. And usually if somebody's got a shop, they've got things to teach you, so that can be a double bonus. A pole barn like this one, or like a more modern pole barn, is sort of the entry-level building. Not exactly entry-level, because pole barns are terrific, or can be terrific. If you doubt that, go to Jimmy Duresta's channel. Look at the shop that the fellow from RR Building built for him. It's gorgeous. And it is the first example of that sort of pole barn construction that I've seen, where the poles, instead of being embedded in the ground and cast in concrete and sized to provide the shear strength and resistance to lateral forces that we use around here, they're set on concrete piers that have got a steel post base and they're bolted to the post base and then the shear is accomplished with strapping and X-bracing and then finally the sheathing on the outside. I hadn't seen that before. And it is instantly a better system than the pole barns we build out here, where we rely on the pressure treating to keep the posts from rotting off when they're, you know, tamped in gravel in the ground or cast in concrete. And those pressure treated posts are rated for anywhere from, you know, maybe 25 years in ground contact to 50 years in ground contact. And you could perhaps order a 0.40 ACZA pressure treating method and get more than that, but eventually that post is going to rot off, especially if it has a heart center and it checks, it cracks down to the heart and the water runs in and they rot from the inside out. So even though Mr. Duresta's shop undoubtedly took a little longer and cost a little more, it is just plain a superior way to build a pole barn. And besides that, it's got Jimmy Duresta's design all over it, so it's, it's really neat. And that guy from RR Building showed up with exactly the right size crew. Him and a helper, a reach machine and a scissor lift, maximum efficiency, and those boys got some stuff done. It was fun to watch. I learned a couple things. So proceeding in this sort of evolution of what could constitute the ideal shop, you know, a good old-fashioned wood frame building on a slab is hard to beat, easier to insulate, harder to remodel, more expensive easier to um, sort of customize and finish the inside space. and They're nice. Cost you a little more money. Take you a little longer. And then moving up the food chain, what you see a lot of around here when people have money for a shop or if it's an industrial application would be an engineered metal building. Now those tend to be sort of generic in appearance, but they are permanent and they have really significant value once they're installed because they are essentially a permanent building. But there's something sterile about them. There's something, I don't know, a little too much of the practical pig in that 
approach for my taste, I think, maybe. Maybe that's sour grapes. But you know, the thing that always occurs to me as being the shop that would be so sweet would be a masonry shop. You know, ideally brick. Secondarily, CMU, split face maybe. You know, maybe a little tilt up with some character cast into the panels or I don't know, but there is something about masonry. Boy, is it permanent. Boy, is it secure. And boy, is it expensive. So anyway, I am just so thankful for the shop that I have. I'm thankful to have inherited it from my dad and been able to improve it. I'm thankful for all the tools that I have in here and the friends that I have because of it. And I'm thankful to be able to add on a little space and have a place to do whatever it is I need to do. So anyway, I hope this has been helpful or at least entertaining. And I really appreciate you hanging around. Thanks for watching.